Awesome. So it's four o'clock, let's get started. Hello everyone, welcome to our career panel on environmental policy, advocacy, and law. If you would like to share your name and affiliation and maybe your research area into the chat right now, that'd be awesome. We'd love to get to know more about you. Um, I'm gonna go over some groundkeeping rules. So this is gonna be an informal discussion where all ideas and experiences are welcome. Um, it's gonna be highly collaborative. So we really encourage the audience to uh, ask questions and get involved with our panelists. Um, we do ask that if you do wanna join in the conversation that you just raise your hand um, virtually or if you wanna try and get attention on the screen, that'd be great too. Um, and also to please keep your, mute, your mic muted until we call on you just in case there's any noise in the background. Um, we also highly encourage you to post any comments in the chat box. If you wanna share any resources or ask questions or add any comments, uh, that's more than welcome. And then finally, this event will be recorded. So we do encourage you to uh, put your camera on so that we're not talking to a bunch of boxes, but uh, we understand if you don't wanna be in video. So I'll start by introducing today's moderator, Adan Libu, if you want to give a brief introduction of who you are. Awesome. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Jesse. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Adam Yabu. And a quick intro is I was part of the inaugural Ecology Plus cohort. So it's always nice to come back and see how much progress and all the cool events that are going on. Um, I did my undergrad in environmental science at the University of Maryland College Park and got a minor in geographical information science. And then later on went on to do my um, master's in energy and resources at UC Berkeley. And I'm now currently a product manager at Energy Solutions, which is an environmental consulting company out here in downtown Oakland. But I'm actually also in transition and move into the EPA shortly in the next couple of weeks um, to their region nine office in San Francisco, um, working on grants management and implementation uh, for land, air, and uh, sort of water remediation efforts. So nice to meet you, everyone. And today I'd like to turn the spotlight now to our esteemed panel. Uh, so first, I would like Dr. Heidi Weiskel to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about who she is. Thanks so much, pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I'm Heidi Weiskel, I'm a staff scientist at the Environmental Law Alliance Worldwide, which is an international network of public interest environmental lawyers in about 80 countries around the world. So we have a, a network of 400 of them. And my job as a scientist within our NGO, which is based in Eugene, Oregon, is to provide any scientific assistance that I can to those lawyers who are going into court and bringing cases and working on law reform and trying to sort of, you know, sit down with, uh, with policymakers and um, produce new, new laws. So um, I've been doing that for about 10 years. I got my um, PhD in ecology from UC Davis. And then before that I did a master's at Tufts in animals and public policy. So straddling the policy world a little bit, but now firmly working with, with lawyers. So it's been great. And I was part of the um, Ecology Plus uh, mentoring inaugural group and really loved it. And I'm glad to still be here with all of you today and part of the team. Awesome, thanks Heidi. Uh, next up we have Dr. Emily Klein. Hi everybody, um, I'm Emily Klein. I am the Aquatic Sciences Officer at the Pew Charitable Trust. We are based in Washington, DC, but I actually live in Vermont. So I've been working remotely even before the pandemic. Um, I've only been with Pew for about a year. Before that, I worked um, for Boston University, um, did some work with the federal government, and then also worked uh, at Princeton University after getting my degree. So kind of a circuitous route um, to get to Pew. Uh, but I am a marine ecologist by training, really interested in understanding holistically how we do ocean governance and how we connect that governance to benefits and costs to people in different communities, I'm particularly interested in learning more and making sure that our work uh, um, connects with environmental justice. Um, and I think I will leave it there for now so we can have time to discuss. Awesome, thanks, Emily. And next we have Maya Harmon. 
Uh, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Maya Herman. Um, I'm a legislative assistant for Senator Martin Heinrich from the state of New Mexico. Um, I'm from New Mexico originally. I grew up in Albuquerque. Um, I've worked on Capitol Hill for about 15 years, 13 of them with Senator Heinrich. Um, and I'm a legislative assistant uh, for natural resources and the environment. Uh, so I cover issues including public lands, water, wildlife, mining, forestry, as well as things like air pollution, water pollution, hazardous waste, regulation of chemicals and consumer products, flood control, and more. Um, like a lot of Capitol Hill staff um, who work directly for a member of Congress or a senator, um, I don't have a technical background in the issues that I cover. My background is in public policy and, and political management. Um, in my daily work, uh, I meet with a lot of people, lobbyists for industries and advocacy groups, um, constituents, federal agency staff, and um, I use that to help make recommendations on things like votes, legislation, um, letters, statements to the press, uh, to the senator. Um, and I think I'll leave it there and uh, look forward to everyone's questions. Awesome, thank you all for those wonderful introductions. And so before we open up um, the panel with some questions, I'd like to remind everyone that this uh, is a conversation for you all. So feel free to drop your questions in the chat or raise your hand if you wanna speak up and ask any of our panelists a question as well. And so, Remember, you're welcome to always jump in and ask your questions as they come up. Uh, so I would like to start uh, our session today with the first question, which is, what is the difference between environmental policy, advocacy, and law? So this is just opening to any of the panelists who's brave to speak up first. <laughs> I can tackle part of that question. I'm interested in what other folks have to say. Um, I think on Capitol Hill, we often confront the question of what's a legal question and what's a policy question. Um, a legal question is what is the law and how does, does it apply to this to a particular situation? And how do we advocate for a good outcome within the law as it is? Um, a policy question is what should the law be and how do we get it there? And um, Capitol Hill in particular is a great place to make progress on the policy question. Um, we get to write new laws. There are a lot of uh, professions that you work within the laws that exist or try to uh, change interpretations of existing laws. And um, the amazing thing about working on Capitol Hill is when a law is bad, you can make a new one. It's hard and it takes a long time, but, the, but you can do it. So I think that's my law versus policy distinction. I think one of the things that I've noticed working with um, with lawyers um, so much in the last 10 years is that I've come to realize that um, they have a very specific way of thinking about science and the use of science. And, um, and so I remember, for example, I was going through a training uh, to be an expert witness in court. And the lawyers were telling us, you know, we only wanna hear the good facts that you have to bring. And we couldn't, I couldn't believe it because obviously as scientists we're trained to have to take into consideration all the facts, to review the literature, to understand the systems or, you know, to sort of take the preponderance of the evidence and then, and then um, craft the best scientific uh, conclusions and, and results and put that forward as our recommendation if that's what's called for, but not to sort of have good facts and bad facts. So it's been a really um, amazing evolution for me to figure out how to hold on to my integrity as a scientist, but then to really think about the benefits of how we can use, you know, the degrees that or the disciplines that we've been trained in to work specifically with lawyers who are saying, look, we're bringing one case right now, we need to know, you know, is this development of a breakwater on a coast, if it is this going to erode, you know, increase erosion on the coast, that's all I want you to answer just that very small question. Um, and so I think that that focus on specificity of information and understanding the, the specific legal requirements of a case and then, and then figuring out how to keep the scientific integrity, but then help that lawyer make the right argument or the best, the strongest possible argument is a, um, a really distinct thing about, about sort of existing in that legal world. Uh, 
And that actually, Heidi, you sent it up nicely for me too, because um, I feel like that is similar to working within Pew. So the Pew Charitable Trust, you know, that one of our one of our aims is to offer to be unbiased um, and to be science based and fact based in the work that we do, um, and to provide that information. Sort of, we have it's very clear within our organization the folks who do sort of the science side, and then we have advocacy arms who might sort of interact with Maya, for example, and work with them on provide making sure that science goes on into policy and helps craft good policy and use that in sort of an advocacy way. But as a nonprofit, we have very strict guidelines around how much sort of advocacy we can do and how much interaction we can have on that side of things. But for my team in particular, as um, a scientist coming into this, I'm on the, the team that looks at the science and similar to what Heidi said, it's the same sort of situation where, what is the science saying for this particular idea that a team wants to pursue? So they may have something that they wanna talk about for example, I um, advise the International Fisheries um, team. And so they have certain goals that they're interested in. And I help sort of say like, what is the science around that goal that you're, that you're thinking about? What sort of questions are outstanding and what, where can we put some money to sort of help answer those questions and bring more science into bear on that question so that you, when you're going forward and sort of trying to make a difference in terms of policy or in terms of law that you have that science and that basis. So it's interesting, um, Heidi, I think there's some similarities and a lot of what you just said really resonated with me and in the job that I'm in now. Awesome, thank you all for your responses. And uh, just another reminder, feel free to pop any questions in the chat or if you have any specific questions based on uh, what you've heard so far, uh, always feel free to just raise your hand or just pop something in the chat and I'll bring it up as well. And so the next question, um, you all sort of touched on it in your introductions. Um, so what do you do daily in your job? It could be as specific or minute as you want to share. I guess we'll go, we'll go backwards this time. Um, <laughs> uh, I, so my job, um, I think the, the most interesting thing switching over from an academic position is the sort of diversity of projects that I'm involved in. So I no longer publish. So publishing and proposals and teaching, those are aspects of the academic job that I sort of left behind when I went into the Pew Charitable Trust. But now I also advise across a much wider range of teams. So I provide sort of science advice international fisheries to um, teams that are looking at marine protected areas, but also um, some on human interactions and trade-offs with the US lands and rivers teams, um, thinking about sort of climate change and some do, doing some scoping and thinking about new ways, new areas of work that you might wanna do. Um, so I am engaging on the science across quite a range of different teams and providing them with what they're thinking about what they need on a daily basis. So a lot of my day, um, it's calls and meetings with folks, lots of, you know, emails, but also reading. I do some reading. I review documents. Um, I might help, help teams sort of think about and network, you know, where would they be thinking about who is doing the work that they might be thinking about, who can I connect them with, um, and then also sort of like brainstorming and scoping ideas about where they might be thinking about doing, doing something new or next. Um, and so those are sort of the things that I do on a daily basis for me, I really enjoy it. I think it's a lot of fun to be thinking about different projects and sort of offering um, advice and um, thoughts and you know what is the state of the science for these things. Um, I will also say that Pew is trying to do a lot internally around DEI. So there's a lot of opportunities for me to be involved um, in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what are the actions that Pew wants to do or changes that we want to make both internally as an organization and externally with the groups that we engage with and the work that we fund. So being, a, uh, I'd say probably at least 10% of my job is engaging on those topics as well, which for me has been um, really great to see and I look forward to that work into the future too. That's such a good advertisement, Emily. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I spend a lot of my time, well, before the pandemic, I traveled a lot, probably six countries a year because Elaw's work is all international. And, and so there was a lot of sort of requirement for me to go and see what was going on on the ground um, in terms of ecological damage or um, understanding an area and, and sort of matching up what 
an environmental impact assessment might say, which is the document that we're required to review to assess the, the validity of a, a potential project coming up. Um, so we review those documents and then we would look, you know, we say like this, I'm not sure this is right. And then if we have the opportunity, we can, we can ground truth it. We can go to the country or go to the site and, and sort of see, um, whether or not it's, it's the real deal and whether or not the proponents actually accurately, um, described and, and, uh, analyzed the, the potential impact of the project. Um, and so I think I spend, you know, so I spend a lot of time traveling um, and so that, I'd say that's one area sort of reviewing the environmental impact assessments and, and ground truthing them. And we had an amazing example. I remember I went to, to Chennai, we were trying to stop a coal fire power plant on the coast of um, Tamil Nadu. And I had read about this, you know, the EIA said that no one is using the beaches and there's no, um, there's no uh, sort of, you know, this is open land. And so it would be easy to, you know, build a jetty and bring the coal in and, and build the, the coal ash pond. Um, and it will be, you know, no one will be affected. And it'll be implicated. It'll be no problem at all. And so I was pretty skeptical. And, and so we got some, some money for me to be able to go. And, um, and in fact, of course, when I got there, we saw like there were fishers all over the beach using the beach to mend nets and, and to um, repair their boats. And, and then we ended up teaming up with this um, Fisher who learned, taught himself GIS and was able to sort of put the, create these maps to show how his community and, and other communities were using the beach. And then we were able to push back against the proponents of the project and say, you know, we have evidence now, like we have clear, clear evidence that, you know, many people, many communities are using this beach. It's not empty land. And this was a, this EIA and the project should be rejected um, because it's, it's false information. So that was very satisfying. So sometimes Sometimes those trips can be really worthwhile. That plant has not been built, which is really exciting. But, but yeah, and then I'd say the other half of my job is educating, um, oftentimes educating judges. They're so it's really a travesty how few judges around the world have a real understanding of anything environmental. And so a case is, could easily come up before them in their courtroom, and they would have every intention of doing the right thing or listening carefully to both sides, but they really don't, they don't understand the vocabulary, they don't understand the, the importance, you know, I mean, I think I had a a case in Belize where I was trying to explain like the importance of um, protecting soft sediment. And it's mud if you don't know, if you're not a marine ecologist and haven't studied how important that that habitat is for all, so many reasons. Um, and um, and so I had you know a long a long talk with the judge there. And so it's rewarding when you, when the judges want to listen and they want to be kind of better informed so that they can make uh, the best possible decision in their in their courtroom. So yeah, a lot of time educating. I think those are the two things and reviewing impact assessments and and educating, working with judges. Um, yeah, as I mentioned in my intro, um, I meet with a lot of people, um, lobbyists, constituents, federal agencies, uh, elected officials, um, and anyone else. Um, Senator Heinrich sits on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and I handle the natural resources half of that. And so I prepare um, background and questions for hearings. I make recommendations for markup votes in committee. I prepare materials and statements. Um, if he'd like to offer an amendment to someone else's bill, I work with committee staff to prepare his, his bills for consideration by the committee. Um, and I help the Senator develop a legislative agenda. So sort of from a big picture perspective, um, what issues does he want to be especially forward leaning and proactive on? How can he do that through sponsoring legislation? Um, are there opportunities in committee to highlight a particular aspect um, of an issue or bring an issue to the attention of other senators? Um, how can he work with other senators to um, gain their support for the issues that are important to him and work with them to move those priorities forward? Um, and I work with staff from other offices to um, persuade them to advise their uh, senator to support the things that, that my boss is working on. Um, I also work really closely with our state staff. So every um, House and Senate office has 
at least one office for the house offices with small districts. Um, but for us, we have a large state. So we have five offices in New Mexico and about half of our staff is located in New Mexico and about half in DC. And so those people, those field reps are uh, the Senator's eyes and ears on the ground in the communities that he represents. And I work with them very frequently to hear what issues they're hearing about from constituents to get their advice on um, how a particular vote or letter would affect the community that they live in um, and just sort of generally ensure that the issues that are of greatest interest in New Mexico are being addressed on Capitol Hill. Um, and then kind of the third chunk of my job is I work with a lot of federal agencies. Um, I joke that my alternative title is bureaucracy wrangler. Um, Public lands is in many ways a very uh, local issue. Um, Bureau of Land Management, National Forest Lands are literally people's backyards. And so sometimes, you know, someone needs to build a fence or someone needs to put up an electric line or dig a well um, or extend a road. And those are in some cases decisions that need a federal permit to put your driveway here instead of there. Um, and so I work with a lot of federal agencies to make sure the constituents are getting the attention that they need, that decisions are considered well, um, that the agencies are following the law um, and, and just help people navigate the bureaucracy, which can be very confusing from the outside and sometimes from the inside. Um, but we are a big part of the role of Capitol Hill offices is to make sure that um, that agencies are giving constituents the attention that they deserve. Awesome. Thanks for sharing the many interesting and cool stuff you guys are working on. Uh, I see there are a couple questions in the chat. Uh, I think the first question I see is from Jesse. Uh, Jesse, are you able to come off, um, come on this, your speaker or your, your microphone to ask your question? Uh, sure thing. Uh, thank you. Um, I was wondering uh, if there were any subjects during college or post-college that you wish you engaged with more to help prepare you for your careers in either the environmental sciences or in more of the law field. I, I can start if we want to flip orders. Um, uh, this is not helpful for all of you, but um, I probably should have taken a couple more science classes during college. Um, so my undergraduate degree uh, is in public policy. Um, my specialization was urban policy, and now I write wilderness bills for a living, so you never know where you're going to end up. Um, and, you know, I took one environmental policy uh, class in college, um, but other than that, I took a lot of classes in you know, transportation design and uh, how do cities function as communities and, um, you know, what role does education play in the life of the city and, and things like this. So, um, so probably should have taken another science class or two. Um, but I'll say on Capitol Hill, um, I'm not an outlier at all. Um, most staff, particularly for member offices, um, have a background in public policy or political science, but most don't have a technical background in the issues that we cover. So um, some of those meetings that I take um, are with experts like all of you, and I get to learn fascinating science all the time um, from a wider range of, of technical experts that come in and, and tell me about um, New Mexico's water future or why forest fires act in a particular way. Um, but science, more of it. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Even if you have all the science training all over your CV, still you can always learn more and take more. Um, I think for, two, for me, two different um, areas uh, would have been valuable for me and, and um, yeah, I recommend them generally, but um, one is languages. It's really useful to know other languages. And I think in my case in particular, um, we, there's, I don't, I wish that I had learned Arabic actually. And even though there are many um, different kinds of Arabic, I wish that I had at least learned um, sort of one basic kind of Arabic because there are so many lawyers who are working in the Middle East and North Africa 
and they're doing really incredible environmental work. And it's, it's almost completely cut off from us in the way that we're working because um, there, a lot of them are trained in Islamic law, which is like a totally different, uh, has a very different approach to environmental protection. Um, and it would be so valuable for us to have, to be able to, to work with them more um, uh, in more depth. But right now we all are relying on our French for the work we do in Morocco and, and Tunisia and, and Algeria. And, and we're looking, you know, it's, we're, we're just hoping that our Egyptian colleagues, they all do, they all speak English. And so we just rely on them for that, but it's a, it's difficult um, for us to be, or for our partners to be in the position of always being the ones to translate their work and all of the legal um, expertise that they're bringing. And then they have to, on top of that, bring it into English or, or another language that our staff can recognize. So that's something I really wish that I had uh, in my back pocket that I could speak Arabic, um, but languages in general. And the other thing is, um, I think a lot of people in the legal and policy world and the advocacy world throw around economics terms all the time without really understanding or having done any um, academic or practical work in the world of natural resource economics or, or economics in general. And I think um, I try to stay away from those arguments because I know, all I know is that I don't understand them enough to use them well. Um, but they are incredibly, it's, it's just an incredible, valuable, uh, incredibly valuable science. And I wish that, that I had more training in it. So yeah, definitely encourage both of those areas. And I'm just gonna second Heidi on the language and economics. And I would add social sciences are also, especially if you're really thinking about um, the intersection of science and human communities and people. Um, even if some a social science class seems a little bit um, not like you don't have say an, inter, an environmental justice class available, but even like some basic social science, those also would be really good classes alongside picking up a language if you can, and then also economics. Um, I did try to take a language and it was really tough for me, but um, I think all of that, all of those would be really good skills to have. Um, and maybe follow one of the, the classes that are really of interest to you, because I think anything sort of broadening um, what you're thinking about uh, will probably benefit you as you move forward. So thanks for that question, Jesse. And thanks to our panelists for those insightful responses. Um, so next, there's another question in the chat from Darcy. Uh, Darcy, I see you have two different questions. Do you wanna come on the microphone and ask both of them? Sure. Um, hi. Uh, the first question is um, how important it is to have a PhD or master degree for those positions? And then the second um, question, I think you guys already answered um, in terms of what would be important for students to know um, to apply for those positions in terms of skills or courses, which you already answered. But uh, for grad students, um, if you guys can give more uh, comments about skills, because we already have a college degree and all of that. Thank you. I can go first again. Um, I think as far as degrees, it is common for legislative assistants and more senior staff um, to have a master's degree is the, the usual degree. Uh, we have some lawyers, uh, but fewer than you would think for an institution that writes laws. Um, and But I will say that most people start on the Hill um, with only a bachelor's degree. I went straight from college to grad school uh, for good reasons, and they, they were the right reasons. Um, but most people come as a staff assistant um, or other junior staffer um, with only a bachelor's degree, get a few years of experience and, and then go to grad school, either full-time or DC has a lot of part-time um, master's programs. Um, we do have a, a occasional PhDs on our staff. We had a very long-term energy staffer who was um, a PhD in nuclear engineer. Uh, he was super handy to have around, um, but I would say PhDs are the, are a rarity. And then, oh, skills, um, writing. Take a writing class. Take three writing classes. Um, 
I spend a lot of my day writing, not necessarily long things. I write five paragraph letters on a regular basis, but I also write legislation. And to write legislation, you have to be able to craft a really excellent sentence um, that has all the commas in the right places, that has all of the phrases correctly ordered and with clear antecedents and uh, take a writing class. Thank you. Oh my goodness, I definitely second that. Um, as a, an adjunct professor, that is that is what I, that's the brick wall I run into every single time that I teach. And I think, oh, I should just, I should just do a side, side course in teaching, teaching writing. Um, it opens a ton of doors for you, no matter what direction you go in, in your professional life. Um, so for my work being an expert witness in court, you have to have a PhD. Um, and yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and in terms of skills, I think it's a great question, Darcy. And I think um, one of the things that I would say, and I'll, I'll just illustrate it with a, with a quick story. I think um, it's really important, I have found to be able to, this is more of sort of a soft skill rather than something you might put into your CV. But um, I think figuring out the right balance of when to sort of raise your hand and say, I'm the expert in this room and I'm gonna you know, kind of initiate the conversation or I'm gonna correct someone who's saying something in incorrect. Um, and when to sort of, you know, hold back can be really important. And um, I had an experience where I was trying to, I was invited to talk to these Ukrainian officials about um, small hydropower uh, in the Carpathian Mountains a few years ago. And I'm a marine ecologist, not, not, and I don't know that much about small hydropower, but um, this was the opportunity for our partners to talk with the officials. And so, I panicked and I'll be honest, I called my PhD advisor and I said, I'm not prepared to do this. Like I, this is not what I got my degree in. I don't know anything like you could look at my CV and think, why are you giving us advice? Um, and he said in that room, you're going to be the expert. And so stand up and be the expert. And so I did. <laughs> and, um, and we were able to get some, some changes made to some of the, the small hydropower plants that were going in. Um, and I think that was a good learning experience for me because I was ready to be humble in that situation. And, um, and then I realized that given the, all the different circumstances, it made sense for me to stand up and be the expert. Um, but there are definitely other times when, you know, the media will approach you and say, you know, we want your recommendation on this or what do you think? And at that moment, it might be really important that you not stand up and be the expert, even if you are, even if you know that you're like the number one person in the world who knows about this issue, depending on how that you know, could get played out and being aware of the politics, you may not wanna stand up and be the expert at that moment. So I think figuring out that balance of sort of real strong self-confidence, like I am the expert and I can do this and knowing when to step back and be quiet or be humble um, is really valuable. So that's a soft skill to, to think about. Thank you. Thanks. Again. <laughs> And I would just add, so for working at Pew, my team has both PhDs and masters. Um, I have a PhD, but other folks at Pew have master's degrees. Um, I think there's probably folks that just have a bachelor's, maybe in some of the other teams. I think it's just uh, a little bit longer of a road once you're hired probably because like many places having the additional education sort of puts you in a different bracket in hiring or makes you eligible or not eligible for different positions. So Pew is an organization that works that way. So the amount of education sort of transfers to your experience, and then that makes you eligible for, or not eligible for positions depending. Um, and I do think that there is some support for if you wanted to get a degree after you're already hired and you needed to get a degree to sort of move on. Um, so, you know, just that, that there are options, I think like Maya said, like you can always go ahead and get started. And then if you decide to, or if you have a master's and you decide you want to get go get a PhD for some reason, um, although I don't feel a lot of pressure to go on to get a PhD, I think most people do start with the master's um, at Pew. Um, I think in terms of skills, I wanna second the writing skills. And I also wanna sort of build off of the idea about soft skills too. Um, and the idea of like, when are you an expert? So for everyone on the call, like you're already experts in a lot of things. And some of those things are learning stuff. 
learning, being able to learning stuff, learn stuff, process things and provide sort of, you write reports, you write papers, you know how to, how to learn things really fast and you know how to communicate that. And so when you come through, especially grad school, you end up with a lot of skills that are super useful that you don't realize are useful because every feels like everybody has them. So things like being able to take a course and you know you need to learn about X, Y, and Z in the next two weeks. Like that's not something that nor that normal be normal people that necessarily everyone knows how to do really quickly. And those sorts of skills are super useful when you're in my position and you need to sort of process a lot of information, figure out what the main points are, and then be able to yeah decide that you're the expert on this in the room and you can advise. Um, and being able to sort of understand um, that you have those abilities, those are really useful. Um, I do think also thinking about like science communication and that sort of fits in with the writing side of it, um, but gaining some skills in science communication, if you're interested in that side, that would also be some useful skills to think about. Um, but those seems to be the kind, those are the things that I think are useful for me. And also sort of being able to think across disciplines too, and sort of how you might sort of connect different things together. Um, but those are things that you sort of pick up as you're in grad school, because you're asked to do that as part of your classes, whether you realize it or not, so. Awesome, thanks for that question and thanks for those answers. So there are two similar questions in here from uh, DeAndre and, um, Karina. So basically, they're asking, so if they're currently very technically um, uh, studious, or there are studies of mainly technical um, courses or majors, how do they incorporate public policy, um, sort of, and other mixtures into their already science heavy and technical backgrounds, without overwhelming themselves as Karina adds to her question. Yeah. So I'm happy to sort of pick this up. Um, I think that's a really good one. And I think it's really tough to find that balance. Uh, I think that that is something that you can, a place to start sort of reading, whether that's in the scientific literature, there may be blogs out there, folks on social media, but I think across a lot of these dis dis disciplines, people are thinking about how they're useful in an applied way. And if you can read about what other folks are doing, um, and often the people who are really interested in doing that are interested in putting that work out there, not just in the scientific literature, but in a place that's more accessible to more folks. And there might be a way to say like, okay, I'm in environmental engineering. How is this being used in, um, in for X, Y, or Z? And try to go and look and see what other people are doing. And that might inspire something for, for you to be thinking about. Um, and because there's always going to be sort of applied questions. You can always also think about what are the questions that are interesting to you? What are the, if you're interested in sort of an advocacy, advocacy or policy or law career, you know, what are the reasons that you're interested in that? And that might also help you to sort of craft some questions or some Google searches to sort of say, these are the questions that I'm really interested in. Um, what are the outstanding, you know, what is the research around this? What are people doing around that? And then, you know, that's why, you know, we're all here. And that's why it's important for all of you to sort of continue on in your careers because we need to be thinking about this in new ways and be creative. And so um, that might be a bit of a hand wavy question, but I think that it's for you to sort of think about what other people are doing and then also find a way that you could start to answer those questions yourself and be creative in the ways that you can start thinking about pulling those things in. Um, if you have mentors or advisors you can talk to, you can also ask them. Um, if you're taking courses that seem interesting, you could talk to the professors who are teaching those courses too. So. Thank you for that. Can I also follow up on that question? So as um, in your companies that you guys are working with, have you found that, have you worked with people that are more technical, like myself, like I, I'm going into engineering and it kind of worries me because I know, for example, um, I'm not sure who said it, but we do need to hone down on our writing skills. And in engineering, there's not much of that um, in terms of let's say like writing essays, we're doing technical reports in our laboratories, but um, I found that like, I used to be a good writer and now I go to sit down and write an essay and, and, and like the words just don't flow anymore. So what advice would you have for me on that? I can talk, or okay. Heidi, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Maya. Um, 
you know, I, I guess I would have two pieces of advice. Um, it's been a long time since I've been in college, but my college did have a specifically professional writing class that wasn't a technical writing class, but was a professional writing class um, that got down into, you know, the construction of sentences and um, when you should use a passive voice verb, um, sometimes it's a good idea. Um, and so if you have that opportunity at your institution, I would recommend doing it. Um, you know, it, it may not be directly applicable to your technical writing now, but knowing how to create a good sentence and knowing how to fit those together in a good paragraph will always, anywhere you go, um, be a good job skill. Um, I will also say, or put in that um, AAAS, which I'm gonna forget what their acronym stands for, American Academy for the Advancement of Science, <laughs> has um, a, a Washington fellowship program. Um, I believe it is only for PhDs um, as well as MDs and other kind of um, terminal degrees, um, but it's mostly uh, recent graduates from PhD programs, some mid-career, and they fund fellowships for scientists to come spend one or two years either on Capitol Hill um, in an office, we have two AAAS fellows in my office right now, um, or the larger program is actually in the uh, executive branch. Um, I know that some other um, scientific societies have separate fellowships as well. If you're really interested, if you're finishing your science PhD and you know that you wanna work in policy, um, the, the best way to do it is through a program that brings you to Washington and um, puts you in a position to make that transition. Um, if what you wanna do is, is Capitol Hill or federal policy, um, those are, are great programs that we um, use directly and have fellows in our office every year. Thank you so much for that. And by the way, there's a few more questions in the chat. I don't know if you guys wanna read those. They're, they're actually really good questions. Awesome, I'll move on to uh, this question from uh, Auburn, who is hitting at some of the pain points you have in your roles. Um, his question, uh, their question is, do you ever get frustrated by the lines drawn between law, policy, and advocacy in regards to limited environmental protection efforts? If so, how do you push through this frustration to make a difference within your respective fields? I can go first and be brief, which is that part of what I like about working on Capitol Hill is that I get to do all three. Um, Senator Heinrich is often an advocate. He's often making an argument to um, agency leaders or to his fellow senators or to state elected officials about what he thinks the right policy is. And a big part of my job is supporting him in that advocacy. Um, we get to write new laws, um, which is amazing. Um, when the policy needs to change, uh, we have a lot of levers um, that we can use to change regulations, to change agency policies. Um, you know, sometimes a tweet is an amazing policy lever. Um, and when the policy is bad and nothing else works, um, when it takes an act of Congress, you're, you're in Congress and acts of Congress are your job. Um, and, and then on the law side, you know, senators also get involved in lawsuits. Um, Senator Heinrich signs probably four, four or five amicus briefs a year um, for cases before the Supreme Court. And, um, you know, legal questions of, of how should the law be interpreted by an agency um, are a constant question in my job. And so I will make a pitch for Capitol Hill that if you're frustrated by boundaries, uh, the Hill is the place for you because we all of it all the time. Um, I just want to actually jump back for a second to the, the last question and the last sort of group of questions, because I think um, one of the other things that I would encourage or actions I would encourage um, those of you who are still in school to take is to um, to think, I think Teresa might have said this actually in the chat, you know, maybe you can get your PhD advisor or your, your master's advisor or even an undergrad professor to sort of recognize that you're interested in, you know, a, another discipline. You're interested in, you know, bringing your scientific skills into the policy or legal community. And um, some advisors are going to be more open to that than others, but it's really, it can be useful to ask, especially if at the same time you sort of 
boldly, but just do it, reach out to maybe an environmental organization that you respect. It could be super local and it, where, right where you're living. It could be a national, it could be an international organization. And um, I know I've mentored like almost 30 science interns um, during my time at ELA. And um, they've all been amazing and contributed so much to what we were doing at ELA. And, and I think that the students got um, the opportunity to sort of see their work go directly either into a lawsuit, the language that, you know, that the um, submission that our lawyers were presenting in front of the court, or, you know, they were in the background and they were developing kind of a, a brief, which is a very different kind of writing, you know, and um, so I think that, you know, that it requires different kinds of writing skills and it also could just require research skills. And you could say like, I know a lot about this issue. I kind of want to do something that's over in the policy world, or I think maybe, I don't know, but let me figure out if this would be useful for me um, because then I'll know if I want to invest in this in my career going forward. Cause you may think you want to do policy and then you start doing it and you don't want to do it. Or you may think you want to start getting involved in legal work and you realize you don't want to do it or advocacy. You just may not want to go down that route, but it, if it has that allure and that sort of luster, like go after it, you know, instead of reach out and say to organizations, look, I've got five hours a month I can give you. Can you use it? <laughs> you know, And so you can put the boundaries around it because you're giving them free labor, but you get the opportunity to engage with professionals who are outside of your specific discipline. And who knows if it's a good rapport that you develop that could open all kinds of doors for you outside of your academic path. And you could still continue on your academic path or you could go a different route. So I think, um, yeah, just be bold and reach out to organizations even if they don't have an internship posted. I don't think we post anything on our website, for example, about science interns, but um, but when students approach us and say, can we do an internship with you? Um, if we have the capacity to mentor that person at the time, then we, then we take them on. So um, yeah, reach out. Um, Thank you. I always thought about reaching out, but I wasn't sure what was appropriate to do. Um, yeah. Because, uh, yeah, but thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I would say definitely. I mean, the worst that you can be told is, you know, we don't have the capacity to mentor you right now, but thank you for engaging and we appreciate that you like the work that we do. And that, you know, you never know. They could say we can't mentor you right now, but we could next year. So keep us in mind if it still works in your schedule. If, um, yeah, it's really good to get used to being told no, because the world tells us no all the time about things. But if you've asked, then you've like gone, you've done everything you can do on your end to, to open all the doors um, that are possible. So, yeah, so I just sort of jumped in on the other question. Now I forget what the question is that we're actually answering, but um, wait, actually, I also wanted to jump in because Victoria said, is it better to get experience before grad school, which connects in a little bit to this, like if you kind of patchwork your academic work and then step take some time out and maybe also do work outside of academia and then go back into academia that can be a good a good balance but um now i'm forgetting what the other what the original question is that we're answering. That's, that's you get frustrated. Yeah. yeah if you get frustrated i think um i am in a very specific place where I work with such extraordinary advocates around the world that the way I overcome my frustration is that I just realize that anything that I can do to support them helps them feel a sense of solidarity and, um, and they feel better if we're behind them. So Elon never jumps out in front of anything. We always sit behind our advocates and um, do whatever we can to sort of be their staff and their team and support them. And they're such extraordinary people and really brave on the front lines, um, risking their lives literally in some cases. And so anything that, even when we don't win, knowing that I'm working with and for people of such high integrity keeps me going. Yeah, and I, I would just sort of second a lot of things. I know we're sort of in a bit of a wandering conversation now, but I think it's all important. Um, one of some of the things that Heidi did touch on though is just you're so you're early in your careers. There's so there's it doesn't feel like it right now, but there actually is a lot of time for you to get different experiences, try some different things. It doesn't have to work. You can still come back to something else and still have something available. So um, 
as we, as you come to the end of getting your bachelor's or even a, a graduate degree, sometimes it can feel like I have to decide everything right now. And that's not really true. You can actually go and try some other stuff, see how that works and then come back. Um, so definitely look at it as sort of um, an adventure that you're starting. It's, you know, I, I took a couple of years off before going to grad school and did field research and that was super fun. Um, I will say to be careful though, I, I agree, like asking for mentorship opportunities, even if they say no, still ask, like, can I talk to you about your job? If you feel comfortable, ask them what they do on a daily basis, you know, ask them how, you know, what they got, they did to get there, just sort of the same conversation we're having today. And most people are happy to talk about that with you for a while. So that's and another way to make a connection with somebody or hear more about what people do. So I think that's also like some really good advice. Um, and I think that, but at the same time, I do want to caution against the idea of um, worrying too much about a voluntary a voluntary position. Um, I'm really hopeful that a lot of organizations are recognizing that they need to pay for labor. So it's one thing if you're if you're like, I've got five or 10 hours a month I can commit, or you know, there's some mentorship that I'm gonna get out of this, and that feels comfortable for you, then that's great. But I think a lot of organizations are recognizing that they can't ask for a volunteer position for like even part of your time, even like 20, 30 hours a week, um, that that's not really, an appropriate way forward. And I would really caution against um, an organization that wants that much of your time for free. Um, your time is valuable, your efforts are valuable, and you should be getting paid for them um, if you're going to be um, putting forward that much of an effort. And there are paid positions for you to take as, you know, as an undergraduate, as a graduate student, in between, after, and there are increasingly more of those options. So definitely keep an eye out for those. Ask people that you know what organizations are thinking about, and you can always get in touch with those folks directly. Um, and then the frustration, I think, on that side, I think you can feel it from multiple directions, whether that's from wanting something to change and it's not changing, or on the academic side, often um, the frustration is, for me at least, was uh, folks in science feeling like, well, we're unbiased and we're subject or we're very objective. Um, and you can't do advocacy because that means that you're biased or now you're subjective. And people re should realize that we're all subjective people. We all bring our own values and ideas to our science, regardless what it is and the decisions that we make. Um, and recognizing that, um, especially in this day and age, you probably do need to be a little bit, a little bit of an advocate within your science. If your science, you know, is something that matters, then you should be able to um, step out and be able to say that. And I think that that's increasingly also also being accepted and encouraged. So hopefully there is some way through that frustration. And I think that there may be increasingly ways through it in the future too. Awesome. Thanks for that. Uh, that's very helpful. Um, Jesse, did you have a question? I saw your hand was raised. I'm not sure if that was. Oh, I was clapping. On uh. <laughs> don't, don't give your labor away for free. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So there's uh, another question like two questions that were sort of similar. Uh, one was from May earlier, um, which said, let me scroll up because I think I may have skipped it the first time. So much going on in the chat. Okay, where is it? Well, yeah, May, so, do you wanna, I'm sorry. May, do yeah. you wanna ask the question and just unmute really fast if you're able to? Sure, yes. Um, I was, curious about um, your guys's paths towards the positions you have now and to what degree do you feel like it was planned or intentional or um, do you feel more so that things kind of fell into place organically? I feel like I keep going first. Emily or Heidi, do you want to talk first? Okay. Um, I would say both for me. Um, I knew I wanted to work in policy when I was 18. Um, I knew I wanted to work in federal policy when I was 20 and interned at a state agency. Um, and I knew I wanted to work on Capitol Hill after a summer in DC working or interning for an advocacy group. Um, and so I went to grad school at a place that would give me connections to work on Capitol Hill. I took internships both on and off the Hill that um, built my resume in that direction. Um, I got lucky that my in the staff assistant who supervised my internship with a Maryland office estate to which I have zero personal connections 
um, hired me as a staff assistant um, a few years after grad school. I was with that Maryland office for two years, um, which I loved. Uh, but then now Senator Heinrich got elected to the House of Representatives from my home district representing Albuquerque, who's the first Democrat to ever get elected to that district um, in 2008. So he hired me six weeks into his term as a congressman and um, working for my home state senator as a legislative assistant has been my dream job for 20 years. Um, and I've gotten to do it for 13. Um, on the other side, as I mentioned, my policy specialization in um, undergrad was urban policy. And um, I, I'm still personally very interested in things like transportation planning and transit and how we construct cities and housing density and all of these things, none of which I work on on a daily basis. And I really fell into environmental policy um, by accident. Um, it's a common practice on Capitol Hill, especially in house offices um, for more junior staff to be assigned one or two issue areas that are relatively small issues for the office. Um, to take some of the, bur the work burden off of more senior staff and also to give junior staff a little bit of, um, you know, toe in the water experience on handling an issue area. So the Maryland House office that I worked for uh, represented a very urban district and environmental issues were not at the top of the agenda. And so as a staff assistant, I was assigned environmental issues. And um, when Senator Heinrich, as a new congressman was looking for a natural resources staffer, an issue that is extremely near and dear to him and the reason that he got into politics in the first place. I was lucky to be in the position that I had two years of experience on Capitol Hill handling, handling environmental issues and was a native New Mexican and was sort of the only one with those two things on my resume. And I love natural resources policy. I think it's a fascinating policy area. I think it has really weird problems um, that are a ton of fun to, to solve. Um, I, my poor healthcare colleagues just get to fight over which professionals do which kind of services all day and should hospitals make more money or should insurance companies make more money. And I love natural resources policy because um, we get to solve problems um, in communities and we get to find a third way forward between people who love a resource for different reasons and um, make sure that we can maintain that resource for everyone for years to come. So I did not set out to work in environmental policy, um, but since I fell into it, uh, I wouldn't be anywhere else. I'd say embrace a circuitous path. If it's not a direct route, do, the, do not, shy away from it and do not be embarrassed about it. Do not dismiss it. Just put it out there. You know, this is the path I've taken. And I think, you know, it'll make the most sense to you. And you may look back on sort of decisions you've made and you think, oh, interesting. Yeah. All right. I can, I can tell that story. And you may have to sort of do the work of telling the story so that other people can see the path of logic through um, the decisions you've made and the choices, you know, the places you've gone. Um, but I don't, don't at all be afraid of it. If it's not a sort of like, I knew when I was 10, I wanted to be a PhD scientist. And in my instance, it was incredibly circuitous. I mean, I did my undergrad in um, French literature and performative um, studies. And I studied the, the relationship of the media and it's, um, like the way that it focused on women, female figure skaters and how they performed under pressure. Um, so yeah, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> so don't, yeah, don't be afraid. Be proud of any, any detour you take along the way. And I'll just add to that. I think that, that that's totally right. I think from what Maya was saying, um, you have, you're gonna have a multitude of interests and then you're gonna have your life that also sort of the two things are going to sort of come together and you're going to have things that you still love. Maybe you don't do on a daily basis, but you still really enjoy your career. And to what Heidi is saying is even if you are not sure now, or you like a lot of things, that's totally okay. And that means that you will sort of maybe follow a bit of a security route. There may be decisions that are really important. Um, and they may be not just throughout your career, right? So a lot of the reasons why I'm where I am is because I had what's called the two body problem. So my husband, you know, we were trying to figure out a way after grad school to be together. We didn't like being apart. And so some of the decisions I made were in a way to stay with him because he had his dream job that he could not move away from. So 
Um, so some of those sort of came in and intersected with the interests that I have and allowed me to sort of to make some of those different decisions. So also remember that your life is important too. Um, and some of those decisions within your life and making sure that you have good work-life balance are also going to help sort of make where you end up going. And I think, you know, like I can pin my little, little moments, you know, like taking a biodiversity class and a marine ecology class being those being really important, talking to a professor about, hey, studying um, the feeding ecology of gobies and being like, wow, I really, I can see the importance, but I don't want to do that every day. Um, I'd like to do something that feels like it's in changing policy or changing, you know, being more in the nexus of, of, um, of applied research. Like, so there are little moments that encourage me to go over different directions, but I think, like Heidi said, just embrace things that like embrace the securitist route, understand that you may be doing something that is removed from what you really started at and you will still gonna love it like Maya's saying, you know, and it, that's okay too. Um, and so you don't have to have like one thing that is always gonna be the thing that you wanna do. You never know. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, I know we're almost out of time, but I just wanna add real quick that I'm sort of going through that journey as an early career professional, even from my undergrad. I came in as an engineer halfway through wanted to be an ecologist. By the end of undergrad, I was like, I wanna go into the renewable energy field, end up in grad school doing renewable energy stuff, came out, I was like, huh, maybe I could do that. And then now I'm like, I'm going back to environmental science and now I'm heading back to the EPA. So it's, it's just the journey and enjoying all the skills and abilities you build up uh, as you go through all your different experiences, as well as the people you meet, because you never know you might meet them again, or you might cross paths in whatever, whatever field you're in. So just enjoy the process and continue to learn every step of the way. Uh, I'll pass it back to Jesse to close us off. Awesome, that was so great. Thank you guys. Um, so we're coming to the end of our session. I forgot to mention exactly what Ecology Plus is at the beginning of this meeting. So just real quickly, we are a program that connects diverse and underrepresented students, early career scientists with opportunities and mentorship outside of traditional academia. Um, so you can find us online. I'll drop it in the chat if you wanna learn more. Um, but I just want to do another plug that we're going to have a career panel on careers in agriculture on Thursday, April 7th at 4 p.m. You can check our website and we'll get that up momentarily that you can register there. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, if any of the panelists want to drop their information in the chat. Um, thank you, everyone who came and thank you, panelists. Bye. Thank you. Good to talk to all of you. Yeah. Thanks, so all. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.